Thank you for joining me. I am speaking with Jefferson Stein, a filmmaker from the U.S. And this is our first time connecting, Jeff. Uh, we're going to be speaking about your short film, your award-winning short film, Burros, which translates to donkeys for people who don't speak Spanish. But before we start talking about your film, can you give us a little bit of an introduction in terms of your work as a filmmaker and the trajectory that's gotten you this far? Sure. Um... Well, it's great to connect with you as well. Um, I'm really excited for our chat. Uh, I'm originally from Texas. I was, have been making, you know, movies since I was six. I had like the old VHS camera with like the big tapes, you know, that you could record. Uh, I think my grandma got it for my mom and dad when I was born and to kind of like film me. And so my the, the camera that my baby videos are on was kind of like this, dusted it off and, and made a little tiny you know, dumb movies when I was a little kid. And that sort of transitioned into two and kind of like acting and theater. And then my theater school or my theater program had, uh, they, they started a film program. And that's the first time I got to kind of be behind the camera in a more organized mm -hmm. way. Um, and I loved it. Um, and I made movies throughout high school. I would, you know, me and my friends would convince the English teacher every year to let us do a big film, like a 30 minute film instead of the group <laughs> English paper. So we right. made three different films, uh, you know, each year uh, throughout throughout high school. But then I ended up going to business school. I really, I wasn't sure if like filmmaking could work. I had like a lot of pressure from my folks to do a normal degree, right. and um, right. I did. And then pretty soon into business school, I was just uh, you know unhappy. And um, a lot of the film business is business, you know, and pitching and things like that. So I think that like really helped. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, as soon as I graduated, I, I started grad grad school for film uh, here oh, wow. in Los Angeles, yeah, in Pasadena at a school called Art Center. Um, I only applied to one school. This is like the school I wanted to go to. <laughs> I met, uh, you know, the dean of it and, and I went. And so, um, like, I don't know, I never graduated film school because I left to go do commercials in Dallas. So a company in Dallas signed me to do commercials. I did something like maybe a hundred commercials um, wow. starting when I was like 25. So mm -hmm. I got just thrown into it and got to do a lot of different genres because Dallas is a secondary market. Yes. Um, it's not so, you know, I didn't have to specialize. I kind of just, whatever they threw at me, I would go out for. So mm -hmm. got to do like <laughs> food, food shoots, you know, for like TGI Fridays, all the way to like dirt bike stuff and like oh, acting, wow. comedy, drama, yeah, everything. Um, and then after I had enough of that, I was like, I need to uh, make a proper short. So I made my first short, which mm -hmm. was like at budget. Um, yes. And that was yeah. this film. And um, it's been amazing. The whole experience has been more than I could have ever imagined it would be. Mm -hmm. I wrote this film um, at, like basically in, 2000, in 2016, you know, I was in Texas and I um, I got really into politics that I had like in a way that I really hadn't before mm -hmm. and just wanted to learn like how all these systems were working. And that eventually led me to um, wanting to know what life is like on the border because Texas is a border state and it's something you hear about your whole life there. And um, it really mm -hmm. got brought to the forefront then. And yes. I wrote this film um, pretty soon after that, like, I think 2017. And I just kind of like sat on it for two years um because I just <laughs> I was like how how are we gonna like how, who's gonna go for this right mm -hmm. like I'm not from the nation I'm not it because it was a, it was it was always specifically written in cells you oh. know I wrote it in an afternoon uh mm -hmm. it was like specifically in cells the locations I found it through my research and on like the map and like I I just wrote this short and so I, I had, had no connections there or anything like that but right. um right. I was so drawn to specifically the Tana Otham nation because of how they have land in Mexico and yes. you know in 2001 the border was militarized and then it was militarized again in 2016 and mm -hmm. that really broke my heart and it was just so it felt like it was something that had been in the news but it just was still something that no one knew about and, and no one really knew the perspective from people living down there, um, right. you know, and like, oh, there's so many complicated forces at play on the border, but specifically on that 70 mile region, mm -hmm. um, US-Mexico border um, with the Tana Nation. And so 
I eventually got the courage to find a producer and Liz and I just got in my, you know, little white Hyundai and we drove from Los Angeles to, to cells, um, got an Airbnb in Tucson and had a, <laughs> you know, call, had a meeting. It was a Saturday morning at like 8 AM. We had to be there, um, for the cells community council and mm-hmm. there ended up becoming our executive or one of our executive producers. I noticed that. Was- that yeah. Yeah, so that was the first day that they had just had elections a month before, and that meeting was the first day he was promoted to chair, like officially. Officially. And so, <laughs> yeah, and so this is like on his first day, he gets sort of like, this is on the docket or whatever, and um, and we talked with them for like over 30 minutes, maybe mm-hmm. 45 minutes. Eventually, they passed a motion, they passed a law to approve the film. And that sort of kicked off this process of like, okay, we have the approval, like what's next and learning about how the government at the nation works and all the different districts and the autonomy and of the communities versus it was just fascinating. Um, And so we ended up living there for maybe like four or five weeks Mm. and um, doing casting and meeting as many people as I could. And it's the relationships that I made. And, you know, that was 2019 those relationships I still have and like Mm -hmm. bear and uh stayed at my place like two weeks ago in this room actually and (laughs) uh, we hung out and I took him around LA and stuff and he's coming back on the 19th for another another festival so it's been a just like I said like an amazing experience um Mm -hmm. and the feedback has been really moving um, absolutely um, you know, maybe to clarify, because I do, um, I am based in Canada, as you know, but I come from Guatemala. So I am familiar mm-hmm. with uh, the historic, like the history of border towns of, you know, um, in Mexico leading to the, to, to the U.S. But um, I think it's important for people who may not be familiar with it. Yeah, um, yeah. So you said it in Sales, Arizona, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you, it was great that you involved the nation. So this is the Thonum Autumn Nation. Yeah. Um, and basically what I found interesting in the research is that the nation itself, the territory encompasses Mexican and U.S. sides. Um, yeah. So that sort of ta- um, in a way makes me think of, you know, what are these border lines, you know, all exactly. about, right? Because yeah. these are family. I'm assuming that families are connected. Um, Very and family. family is so important. Sides. Families are really large. Mm-hmm. And you know, your family's in Mexico. And for instance, Bear told me that, um, you know, they used to go, they had a couple houses or have a couple houses in Mexico where their family lives. They used to go multiple times a week. And um, now that gate is closed. Even now it's so closed. So they have to go all the way around like, and you know, Bear, yeah, to like an actual port of entry. And so because of that, they don't go, it's been years that they've been mm-hmm. over there. And so it was, he said that they will just go up to the gate and like, and see each other just that way. Just kind of quickly connect because it's just yeah. so cumbersome now. Because they can't, uh, you can't drive your car across and the, right. it's only 10 miles from the border on the Mexican side. Yeah. But you can't walk in that, it's crazy. It's kind so. of ludicrous when you think about it, no? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's crazy. So, you know, I appreciate the, um, in reading about the film and watching the film, I appreciate your involvement of the community because it, the story itself is from the perspective of two, of one little girl who is part of the nation and um, who unfortunately, or in a good way, meets another little girl who's um, of uh, Latino parents. So I don't want to give too much away about the plot because I think people should be watching this film. Um, so I'll put the link um, in this post, but, um, you know, why did you think the perspective of children is so important in telling these stories? I think children, uh, for a lot of reasons, but I think children, um, just want to play. They just Mm -hmm. want, you know, regardless of your upbringing, you don't really, as a kid, necessarily understand where your family kind of fits in the world or, uh, your circumstances as a kid it's mm-hmm. just you want to have fun you want to play you want to learn you want to explore mm-hmm. um, my house growing up was back was like the last house and we behind us we had a field like a kind of gross creek but that we would play mm-hmm. in and yeah. then another yeah. field behind and woods I mean that's how we spent our summers just like running around um, just you know, trying to just connect with other local neighborhood kids and and just play. And so I think that was kind of part of it, um, Mm -hmm. of of what 
wanted what maybe kind of want uh Elsa to be like that but I think you know from a from a more narrative standpoint I think like kids you know they don't have those biases they don't have the, a conception of borders or people being different or speaking different languages even something as simple as that mm. um and so Elsa is a lonely kid she lives kind of far out there she lives not like in a community uh in a tight community like her the next neighboring house is pretty far mm -hmm. so she and she's also kind of rambunctious and she doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh friends and, and right. that will play with her right and so when she meets this kid who is like her and um they connect and she's just like oh finally a friend someone I can hang out with and they really bond without having uh, the ability to communicate in a, um, in a in a language, but they can communicate through context clues and things like that. Yeah, I think that's the brilliance of working with children in that they kind of bring you to that level of compassion and curiosity and all in one, right? Um, let's talk about your casting. I understand they're non-professionals, um, people from the community, which is excellent. Um, so you mentioned Elsa, so that um, she's played by Amaya Juan and then her, she befriends Anna, who's played by Sumami Carrillo. So how did you connect with, with each of them? And uh, was it easy? How hard was it to find your cast? It was there. It was hard. It was challenging. But but once we found them, it was mm. just like we knew it was them. So it was, it was challenging and rewarding. We held um, a casting, a traditional casting at The Nation. Uh, only a few people showed up. I don't think people really realized like what we were doing or, you know, trusted us fully. Right. Um, but Virginia, who plays, um, who plays the grandmother Gagi, mm -hmm. she came to our casting, but refused to audition. <laughs> and when I met her and talked to her for five minutes, I was like, this is, this is her. She's, she just needs to be the one. It took me like weeks of calling her and trying to find someone else to play her before she was just like, okay, I'll do it. And I was just <laughs> like, Right. Uh, um, yeah, it was really a word of mouth, very organic uh, casting. We met a lot of community members at that original community meeting and um, were introduced to more people. And Liz, um, who's my producer, Liz Cardenas, she comes from an, a, um, a background in the news, a journalistic background for the Dallas mm -hmm. Morning News. And so she was really on top of it and like had her notepad and had right. everyone's names organized and was really uh, uh integral to, to finding um Amaya and we connected with Amaya's aunt who was one of the people who brought back Toka to the community uh it's the sport you see in um yes. in the film and so we we went to a couple practices and then we finally went to everyone was like you got to find Amaya Amaya would be perfect for this we just kept hearing <laughs> her name so and she's we, known in her community <laughs> A lot of the kids we met were reserved. They were quiet. Right. They were, you know, a bit shy, things like that. And um, and that that could have worked, but it would have been harder because that wasn't really the character. And so, mm -hmm. um, but but Amaya was out there and people kept saying like, because we would describe the character, they're like, that's her. So <laughs> we had an audition, you know, at, after practice and Liz did a improv with her and sat down and Amaya got super emotional and started crying. And we were just all blown away. And I think all the other team members and her aunt were, they were all sitting there and were pretty, <laughs> they were just like, oh, that's her. I think her grandma started crying too. So mm -hmm. um, it was great. And then for Swemi, we did local casting at Tucson, uh, kind of dual uh, speaking, um, dual language elementary schools. So English, okay. Spanish elementary mm -hmm. schools. And um, yeah, we'd go in and lunch. I went to like one school and uh, we cast a lot of different people, a lot of different kids for that. Um, right. But yeah, there was like one where I was just, you know, in the principal's office sitting on the floor, big aquarium behind me with the bearded dragon and kids would come uh -huh. in and we would and, and things like that. But um, yeah, when we found, I think Swemi, she really was special because she doesn't have a lot of ability in the film to to speak and to really communicate in a way that right. anyone understands up mm -hmm. until you know that moment and so she needed to be like so expressive with her face and say so much in a really subtle way didn't want anything to be over the top um you know every actor in the film this was their first time and yeah. that was really um that's why I kind of sat on the film for so so many years before making it because I was just like how is this how are we going to find these people how is this going to work mm -hmm. I never wanted to bring in actors or build sets or Mm -hmm. You know, it was never an option to, well, what if we like, what if this community says no? Like, what if, 
can we do a different and it was never like no we'll just move it to it like it was just this or nothing and right. um I just think we got so lucky and a lot of people in the community supported and put in just so much work so much work to make it happen so yeah it's really- interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking about asking um that in terms of you know it's one thing for you to write it because you are from Texas, but you're not from the actual nation. Yeah. But the commitment to actually involve the the community itself um, before sort of just saying, okay, I'll go find kids somewhere else and, yeah. um, and tell the story elsewhere, right? Because I think the impact of the film, although it might be similar, it, it might, it may take away from what a lot of us are experiencing when we're watching this film. And uh, what I took from the film, if I may share, is that, um, you know, you're watching this film, one, I think of my own community because they kind of look like me, Um, Mm -hmm. but also um, the connection of family and that translated so well because you use people from the community who already know each other, right? And that it's almost like you don't really have to work so hard in creating creating that bond and the understanding mm-hmm. of what's going on around them um, because it really is their day to day. Even though, like yeah. you said, kids aren't really talking about what's happening at the border and you know people crossing and and finding litter and and all kinds of items in the desert, but they are aware. So I feel like that is the power in the in the film with the casting of locals and non-professionals because they already bring that knowledge and that history um, to the story. I think you just kind of gave them that vehicle to, mm-hmm. to kind of share it uh, with us, you know? I kind of, Thanks. so thank you. They- I, I wanted to talk to you yeah. a little bit about the cinematography because location was so key, but also the way that it was shot was really beautiful in, and also very ev- evoking of different emotions. Can you talk about your DP and, and yeah. what that discussion was like? So my DP is Cole Graham. He's Canadian. Actually, mm-hmm. he's from Vancouver. Um, yes. This was the second time I'd worked with him, but we had been friends for quite a while before. Mm-hmm. Um, I st- I met him. I started taking a lot of film photos and posting them on the internet. And um, he reached out to me and was like, hey, uh, let's let's get coffee. And we got coffee and we just kind of became friends, but we didn't really work together. There wasn't a project on the table or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, we did sort of a small project after that as sort of like a get to know each other kind of thing. And it was beautiful and stunning. And I, and he just kept growing as a a DP. Um, And, and um, it was just always the plan for him to shoot it. He shoots so much on film. And so I always knew, um, I, all the all of the commercials I had made were digital, but film was always my where my heart was and what I always wanted my format to be. And I think like shooting those, uh, you know, years of still photography after that mm. was sort of my first sort of dip into uh, kind of getting used to the medium and what it can bring and the emotion right. that can come out of it. Um, and 16 millimeter film was the choice because the de- I didn't want it to feel bleak. I feel like we were actually talking about this yesterday, mm-hmm. but like different reg- different, like there's almost like a cliche of different um, like countries and how the color is portrayed on film. Like Polish yes. films are always a black and white. Um, films <laughs> yes. in Mexico or on the border are always just like yellow mm-hmm. um, and things like that. And so I didn't want it to be this like dreary or like desaturated or, uh, you know, look, I wanted it to look like how I saw it when I went to sales the first time. And that was kind of magical. There were, there were cows sleeping um, on the, on the the steps of the elementary school. Like as we were driving (laughs) down main street, there's all these pastel buildings. There's this tank that's just like in a field. uh, I mean, in front of the kind of near the rec center. And so uh, I wanted to portray all those colors and I wanted them to really pop And 16 gives that kind mm-hmm. of, you know, and that, that texture and the, those colors and uh, 16 is sort of a smaller medium to, to 35, right? It's sort of like this yes. miniature yes. Mm-hmm. version and that kind of, we, we wanted to, te- we wanted to frame it all from like a kid's perspective. So like anytime we could, we could do that, we did. So, um, you know, 16 is sort of a, a lesser version or a smaller version to like 35. Mm-hmm. Uh, we shot in these anamorphic lenses, these beautiful, vin- like beautiful, just 
optically perfect anamorphics, mm -hmm. but they weren't the full anamorphic, right? They were like right. a little right. bit less. They were in between anamorphic and spherical. And so that was like another thing that we could, we were always kind of at the time saying, we're going to, we're making like a mini Western. We're making like a mini adventure, a mini epic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's kind of where the title comes in as well, because like a burro, a bur burro is mm -hmm. a smaller burrito. It's just yeah. like, a, it was one of the first foods that I, I'd heard about them and the first foods I ate when I got there. And, <laughs> um, and so I was like, that's, this is it. This gotta be this, you know, we went to the burro stand and, and everything and, and met with Mondo. Um, so like that was that. kind of the thinking with, thank you with, with, with the cinematography in terms of the color and the lenses, but it's very, um, it's very still out there, but it feels like there's like this energy and um, I wanted to tell it in this kind of objective way. I didn't want to, uh, you know, force any views or kind of like say, this is what I think, or like, this is my solution because mm. such a complicated situation. There isn't like a, you can't just stand up and say like one sentence or even in a 15 minute film, describe what the solution is. I think you can only... Kind of present something and then an audience can walk away hopefully with more questions and right. maybe kind of thinking about themselves and how they fit into the world and things like that mm -hmm. and so letting the audience like letting your actual eye have the like ability and the time to move around the frame and see what you want to see like when you want to see it instead of uh, me telling you okay well, look here and then look here uh, it gives every audience member a different experience and what they are coming into the film with, depending on where they look and what they see, they're going to like come out of it with kind of a different thing. Um, and that was a, a kind of a way to not really force something and and mm -hmm. really let people kind of come to their own ideas. Of course. With... Yeah. Yeah. Because he could easily turn into a bit of a preachy or almost too melodramatic type of story. Right. Um, I'm going to correct myself, although the word burro means donkey. In this film, it's about the food, friends. <laughs> so um, you've heard it from Jeff. A burro <laughs> is a smaller version. <laughs> well, it's a small, it's look, like a small burrito. But yeah, there is. And it looks delicious, let me tell you. Like when I see the girls delicious. hoping to go, <laughs> hoping to grab one, I'm, you know, it totally yeah. brings sort of this feeling yeah. of like street food, for example, like when it you travel exactly. elsewhere. It's very comforting food to eat um and it's something that like families make and um it, it's it's very tied to family but mm -hmm. the, the the donkey connection is also like, very important because there's mm. a bunch of there because uh a burro is someone who kind of like brings like drugs across the border it's the name of a person who does that mm -hmm. but it's also a lot of times brought on the backs of donkeys exactly. and so uh there's this whole issue because well, also the whole thing, like donkeys are smaller horses, right? So we yes, have that. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. But all these donkeys have been brought over and then um, they're not brought back to Mexico. And so a donkey can only survive for, I think, like five days without mm. water right. and it will lose 80% of its body weight and um, they need to be taken care of. And so there's now all of these ranchers on the nation who have had to take in all like hundreds of donkeys over oh, the no. years just abandoned out in these you know in the desert and so that's another um kind of like layer kind of, yeah. yeah it's interesting there's so many there's always so many layers attached to these sort of issues right it isn't just that people are looking for a better opportunity there's so many yeah. other layers that impact the local communities um mm -hmm. as well um um, everyone hoping for a, a turn on a better life, that's for sure. Um, so thank you for telling me about this. It's really, really interesting in terms of the cinematography. Um, I understand that you had only a few days to shoot the film or you just managed to get it done in a few days. What was that like? <laughs> it was hard. It was really hard. We had four days to shoot um, mm -hmm. purely because of budget um, mm -hmm. and kind of timing. It was a lot of reasons, but uh, it was like a four day shoot. And so that was really tough because um, we were our, you know, we, us and our crew, we, we were staying in Tucson, which is about an hour and a half to two hours away from our locations oh, okay. each way. So uh, we would like, we'd pick Swemi up, we would uh, pick Amaya up and her mom, and then we would, you know, and so yes, yeah. there and back. And so that counts as like a lot of your shooting day. And so we had a lot, it was very difficult to make our days and also with all of the driving and then there's no cell service and it also was monsooning so cars were getting constantly constantly stuck 
in, oh, this, wow. in the mud and everything. My car got stuck maybe six times, mm. like, no joke in those like four weeks. Um, <laughs> but it really yeah. changed, it changed my perspective on kind of like what's important. I mean, when you're out there, I remember every morning waking up and just like, is there water in the car? Like that was the, the first thing It's like, do we have, cause you might run into people who need water, you right. know, you, water, you might get stuck, you know? And so that was cell phones and and like computers and that was always like secondary to just like right. is there a case of water in the trunk can you survive uh, for the day essentially yeah and mm -hmm. and anyone that you might run into so yeah exactly. um, but yeah the the distance was really the the main thing it was really like the mm -hmm. distance of going to and from set each day um now that the film has shown at different festivals including tribeca and now you mentioned in, in la as well uh congrats yeah. by the way um you know the people involved in the film i'm assuming they've seen the finished film yeah we um, went and they're down hearing there. all these and um, they're yeah. hearing all these cool news about it um what's their feedback now including the the girl um <laughs> well i'll just say so we we uh in august we 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 went down because we weren't allowed to really show the film for a long time because mm -hmm. of covid and all the restrictions right. on the mm -hmm. and so we planned a big screening we did two screenings back to back in like different days um and had i don't know maybe 300 people 400 people from the community come in total to see it mm -hmm. and i remember and you know the very first question I got was this girl, she was maybe like 12 and because we had a QA and a after with, yes. me, with me and Bear and Liz, uh, our co-producer Corey and um, Virginia was up on stage and Amaya, it was great. And uh, this girl comes up and she just, her first question, she just like, why was it so short? And so <laughs> <laughs> the very yeah. first question. Yeah. Uh, and um, from there, the Q and A's took like a really emotional turn. I mean, the feedback was that it was so powerful to, like you said, to see yourself up on the screen and to see, you, you know, their story. Uh, we had a huge screen in this auditorium at the high school and they just said it was so powerful to see their image up there and their story. And to know, Bear said, to know that, you know, that film, this 15 minute film is being shown all over the world. He said that these little awesome kids are, you know, our being our our their story is in Poland and we've played all these different countries and yes um it was very emotional both days like a lot of crying and a lot mm -hmm. of just uh I think this sort of cathartic release of the you know the making of it and the years that have gone by and the waiting and all of this stuff to finally see it um with the community it was very uh it was very powerful I would think so and I also wonder and not just wonder I also think that it now takes a different life form, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really is about the specific community, but then becomes more universal because we see a lot of displacement across the world. And we often forget, you know, the impact on children, um, you know, and when I look at the news, that's, that's not really what I hear, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like we don't really want to hear that point of view or see that point of view. Um, so it's interesting that, yes, it's very emotional for that community, which totally makes sense. But the rest of us are emotional because we know it's part of that community, but it is also part of other communities, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can only imagine how how powerful it must have been to be there and, and experience that with them. Um, so where are you off to next? You're in L.A. and... Um, um, I believe the film is being available to screen online for a little bit of time. Is that right? Yeah, we're really excited to do that. So it's been online since Thursday um, and we're going to have it online for the month of November. Month of it's November. on YouTube, it's on Vimeo and um, yeah, it's free to stream. And the comments have been amazing. They've been like people, I've been getting all these messages on Instagram from people who say, you know, I live three communities over and, mm -hmm. and it's just like, it's been, it's been a lot to, um, I didn't, like I said, like, I had no idea that this would happen, right? I mean, we, we wanted to make this film. It's kind of a smaller version of this larger story that we want to tell. And, right. um, but the life that this, this short has taken, um, the life that it's had on its own, it's been, um, it's been wild and um, really moving to to see. So yeah, I I, I mean if take it uh, watch it while you while you yes, can hopefully definitely. for those of us uh, who can come in person. Um, for anybody who can come in person, where are you screening it next? 
Um, we are screening next, um, I think, so it's in, it's in the Hawaii Film Festival. Oh, okay. That's an online screening. You can go to our website, um, burrowsthefilm.com, and there's a whole list of everywhere that it's screening. Nice. Um, some are in person, some are not in person. We are screening in Los Angeles at the Red Nation Film Festival, and we're nominated for um, for best short film in the um, Red Nation Awards, which are happening on Sunday, November twentieth, and the film is screening on Saturday, November nineteenth. Nice. Um, nice. And so you can see it in Los Angeles. Then it's going to be at the um, Lumiere Music Hall on Wilshire. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, check the website. There's a bunch of festivals, so. Maybe there's one happening in your area, but if yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice for sure. Um, so I definitely recommend people check it out online if you're not able to make it, obviously, in California. Thank you so much, Jeff. There, um, I learned so much about the process, but also about this film. Um, you know, for people who are curious about your other work, what's what's next after Burroughs for you? So um, like I said, we're trying to make a feature film that's next. Um, so different characters, different story set in, the, in an earlier time, but still uh, with these similar themes and issues, um, exploring a much broader um, story that, um, that can be told in a feature length. And that's the next thing that I wanna do. That would be my first feature, which I'm really excited about. I hope <laughs> it happens soon. And then I'm also um, developing a documentary series um, about the sport, Boca. And um, I want to bring in Native directors to direct all the episodes. And we are going to kind of focus on the community because the sport is so fascinating. It's only played by women. Um, mm. It's been around forever, but it most it more recently kind of got, br got brought back. The different districts have different teams. And um, it's a really neat, it's a really neat sport that I think people would care to, to see. So that's sort of the next, the next few things that I'm working on. Excellent. So where do I find you if I want to know what, where, where you're at? Um, yeah, uh, socials. I, yeah, yeah. Where, what do you want? You, I'll give you my address. No, uh, my. Uh, <laughs> What's your Instagram for people who might be curious about your, your. Work? Yeah, definitely. Um, my Instagram is Jefferson Stein and that's the same with my Twitter and, um, yeah, you can find me, send me a message. Let's connect. I'd love to hear what you think about. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you and yeah, you good too. luck with Thank all the you. other, um, festivals. Thank you so much. It was awesome speaking with you too. Likewise. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.